Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, it is so good to be here in your house. Grant us wisdom today, the wisdom of your spirit, of your word, that we might be fed, that we might be strengthened in our faith, that we might be changed by you. In your name we pray. Amen. I don't get it. I don't understand terrorism. Why the people on the other part of the world want to kill us? I don't understand why someone would go into a school with a gun and shoot children. I don't understand racism. Why hate somebody because they're different than you? Doesn't make sense. I don't understand violence and rioting. What does it accomplish? Why? I thought about that. I also thought there's probably a lot of people that would say, Pastor Braun, I don't understand why you don't understand. I was thinking about that this week. I came across a quote from Rodney King. Now, you all may remember that name. That's the name of the man who was pulled from his car and beat up police officers. And then when the police officers were acquitted, it sparked some riots. And he spoke at a press conference during those riots, and he said, I just want to say, you know, can we all get along? Can we stop making it horrible for the older people and the kids? And and I mean, we've got enough smog in Los Angeles, let alone to deal with setting these fires and things. It's not right. And it's not going to change anything. Thought about that question. Can we all get along? Why can't we all get along? And then we come to today's story in the story of God. The story of the Tower of Babel. And you know that all the things I just talked about have their beginning right there in the 11th chapter of Genesis. The story of the Tower of the Babel, kind of the last story in the prologue that sets us up for the story God begins to tell in Genesis 12, where we're going to go next week with the story of Abraham. And you know what I find when I Turn my Bible right set up. I find that the first answer that we receive here, why can't we all get along? You know what it is? No, we can't. Now let me finish. No, we can't without God. You know, when I used to read this story, it confused me. I mean, think about some of the things it says here. It says, the whole earth had one language and the same words. What's wrong with that? You would think God would be in favor of unity. And it says, as the people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, right? And settled there. Well, they wanted to make a home. That, what's, what's wrong with that? It says, 
Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. God created us to be builders, to be creative. Does he not want achievement? What's, what's the problem? The problem is not that they wanted to build a city. The problem is why they wanted to build the city. It says, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the earth. you got to remember that at the end of, end of the whole flood narrative, God says, be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. He commanded them to be dispersed throughout the whole earth, and what they're doing at Babel is they're saying, no! We're not going to do what you want, God. We know better. We're going to build ourselves a a city right here, and we're just going to stay. It's the sin of Adam and Eve repeated all over again. They don't want to listen to him just like we don't want to listen to him. They want to be their own God. And in fact, the tower they built is most likely a ziggurat, which is a astrological, now get that in your mind, an astrological, not astronomical. Astronomical is science. Astrological is religion. They're starting their own religion. And we'll let the stars tell us what to do, not you, God. And so God says, no, you won't. Guess who wins that argument? It says in the, in the text, it says, The Lord came down to see the city, and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord dispersed them from there. They're going to do what he wanted, whether they wanted to or not. Dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they quit. They left off building the city. And then it goes on. It says, therefore, its name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the languages of all the earth. See, what they face is the same dilemma that every great nation, every great empire has has faced in history when that empire or that nation, and it includes ours, starts to think we're exceptional, starts to pat ourselves on the back, boy, we're good, we've got it, and starts to forget about him. It's the same dilemma you and I face when everything is going well and, and we're prospering and, and, and like we were in February, for instance. And we start to pat ourselves on the back and think I'm making a name for myself. I've got my, this life by the tail. And we start to forget. Who is it? makes all things possible. That's what God is concerned about. Jesus warns us of this. He tells us why God confused the languages, why he wouldn't let this go on. He says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Because that's what happens when we come together without him. So God has designed it that we can't get along without him. But there is a way, right? that we sinners can get along. Indeed, it's only one way. God's way. 
Jesus. See, God sent Jesus. That's what the children's message was about. To undo what sin had done. God sent Jesus to undo the Tower of Babel. And you see it. After he ascends into heaven, the next thing that happens is Pentecost, right? And God gives everybody to speak. They, people hear people speaking in their own language from all sorts of nations. The work begins because that's what, that's what the Bible tells us that God intends to do in Jesus. That's what Paul tells us here about what God intends to do through the church. He says, he makes known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. Here it is, to unite all things in him. Period. That's what God did in Jesus Christ. Go, go a little bit later here in Chapter 2 of Ephesians, talking about Jesus. He himself is our peace, who has made us both one, has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law and commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body, that's the church, through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. I should think about how Jesus did that. He didn't do it by making a name for himself. Jesus did it, the Bible says, by making himself nothing. Wow. Jesus did it not by coming and making us serve him, but by coming not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus did it by the cross, by dying, by letting all our hostility towards each other be turned on him and dying. You know what? Because he did that, Jesus brings us back to each other by bringing us back to God. Wow. Do you know, the Bible never tells us what Jesus looked like. Never. Assume he looked like a Middle Eastern Jewish man, but it never describes him. You know, it, it, it probably, the effect of that has been that every culture paints and portrays Jesus like them. Like them. You know, in, in Frankfurt, Trinity, we had an African nativity set. It was beautiful. And Linda has a Hispanic nativity set at home. It's beautiful. I'll give you another thing. Did you know that when Jesus was crucified, even though it was portrayed like there's a cloth over him, he was crucified naked. They took his clothes off. Because you see, it's important for us because clothing identifies your culture. Tells you, it, it, it tells you what part of the world, people, what part of the world you're from. Well, Jesus there on the cross is just a man. His hands stretched out on that cross are meant to reach across every boundary, to knock down every wall, to silence every prejudice. Bring us together. Listen to these words from St. Paul. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses 
against them. Bringing people together. And so the result of that is we regard no one according to the flesh. For us in Christ, God's call is to quit applying the labels the world applies. Quit worrying about what language people speak, what culture they come from, what color they are, and just simply to see people as they are, simply people whom God loves the same way he loves you and me. Go to the next passage. Look what it says. There is neither Jew nor Greek. And in that ancient world, there were people who hated each other more. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We're to see each other as new. We're to see each other in Christ with his eyes, with his love. See, in his church, among his people, through you and me, God brings people together in Christ. That's the purpose of the church. To be a place where people of every, tri- every tribe, nation, and language become family. Think about that. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's the message of the church. Now, the thing that troubles me saw it on Facebook again. You know, we live in the most diverse county in the United States in the most diverse city. So what that means is we don't look like our community. Why not? I'm not going to answer that. I think it's something we have to wrestle with. You know, truth is, we're Christ's ambassadors, but sometimes we get crossways with each other. This is a place where people come together, but sometimes we get mad with each other. Sometimes, I suppose it happens that we don't may help people to feel welcome when they come. And I, and I suppose it's not even just the physical differences that are out there, the labels. Sometimes it's maybe because, well, I haven't done what he did. I don't want to be around a person like her after what she's done. How can you and I be Christ's ambassadors when that's the way we feel? You know what God does? He tells us how. Luther gave us the explanation in, the, in his small catechism when he's explaining what baptism means, it means that by daily contrition and repentance, the old Adam in us, along with all sin and evil desire, should be drowned and die every day. I wonder if you remember, I got a picture of it up there. I wonder if you remember that cross from during Lent, and we put all those sins on there. Those are all the things that stand in the way of our relationship with God and very often stand in the way of our relationship with each other. And what that was about 
was not that you would sit here and say, well, you know, I hold so-and-so on the other side of the church was hearing that, because if that's what you heard, if that's what you sat here and said, then you missed it. Because this wasn't about anybody else's sin. This was about yours and mine. And we could have added racism. We could have added hatred. We could have put all sorts of things up there. What it takes to be ambassadors for Christ is us beginning with the confession, that's me, Lord, and then letting him take it, whatever it is, every day, and nailing it to the cross, drowning it in the waters of baptism so the new man might arise and live before God in righteousness and purity and for, forever. Every single day, we need him to make us new. It reminds me as I was preparing this about a story that one of the farmers in my first congregation told me. He said, Pastor, you know, there was, he, talk, he gave me the name of somebody else in the church. He said, I, was a, I hadn't talked to him for years. I got so mad at him. I said, why? Well, well, he cheated out of some land I was trying to buy, and he got it. And I know he cheated. I know he wasn't honest. I knew it in my heart. And so I didn't talk to him for years. And then, Pastor, you know what happened? I said, what? pastor asked us to share the peace in church. Okay. And I turned around and held out my hand to the guy behind me before I knew who it was. And it was him. I said, what happened? He said, well, the Holy Spirit went, on, went to work on my heart and said, listen, if you really believe in what you believe, you say you believe in, then you need to forgive and ask his forgiveness and so we grasped each other's hands for the first time in years. And we've been friends again ever since. That's what God desires to do here. We're not perfect. But if the Tower of Babel is where it all began, then Jesus Christ and his church is where he wants it to end. Where we learn to love and forgive each other and welcome others who maybe aren't like us. Maybe even to love and welcome those we might have called enemies. Why? Because, folks, that's the way God has treated you and me. While we were his enemies, Christ died for us. That's the work that God wants to do in this place through you and me. Amen? Amen. Now may the peace of God which pass all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life that is everlasting. Amen.